What's up, everybody? I'm David Hain. Welcome to episode 187 of the A to D from Attic to Disciple podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, please like, subscribe, follow, and share the link with your friends. And can you do me a favor? Could you get two friends to listen to this episode and then chat with them about it? If you'd like to get our curriculum, you can get the paperback or ebook of From Ashes to Destiny on Amazon. When we come back, we'll get into this episode entitled Precious Books. Welcome back to episode 187 of the A to D from Attic to Disciple podcast entitled Precious Books. I'd like to start by just giving a big shout out to our new listeners from Qatar. That brings our total to 65 countries. If you want to help us reach more people in more countries, just subscribe, follow, and share the link with your friends, or click on the support link in this episode's description. Your donation of any amount could change a life. I'd like to give a big welcome to my friends in recovery from the U.S., South Africa, and Australia for their participation in this group episode today. As before, I'll be keeping them anonymous, but I'll be saying their answers as if we're having a live group meeting. So guys, I have what I believe is an awesome idea for this group episode. I often have guys reread my curriculum from Ashes to Destiny or go through the course twice because they've grown and their answers will be different. With that in mind, please react to this quote. It's by Wilfred Peterson. And he said, it is time to browse through the precious books that have meant the most to you that you may rediscover illuminating phrases and sentences to light your pathway to the future. Deep quote. So guys, what books or quotes or Bible verses have been key in the moment when you were desperately trying to attain sobriety that you now go back to in recovery for inspiration for your future? Ben, would you like to start us off? David, this is a great thought, to reminisce on Bible verses or books that have been key in my recovery walk. The first thing that comes to mind was the Bible verse shown to me by a guy named Darrell Ware. It was in a homeless shelter in downtown Memphis, the 18th of September, 2005. He was the one that greeted me at the door of the homeless shelter. He gave me a plate of food after I'd been in the streets nearly a week with less than scraps to eat because I'd been more concerned with attaining drugs than eating. Anyway, the reason I bring it up is I remember as I was shoveling the food in my mouth, he opened the Bible next to me and went to Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. It read, and I quote, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, I was raised in a church, so... I'd always heard scripture, but something about that day and that particular scripture really landed deep in the parts of my soul. It's almost like I woke up after being in a deep sleep for years and years. That said, it's that verse that I've gone back to now for over 18 years to remind myself that in each new season of recovery, even as the addiction still desires to hunt me down and destroy me, I'm reminded afresh in new ways with new opportunities in front of me that God still has plans to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me a future and a hope. And I'm thoroughly convinced that this really applies to all of us. That's why I take it back into the prisons and addiction treatment centers and homeless shelters even to this day, reminding people that God has a plan for them and it's a good plan. Awesome start, Ben. Thanks for that powerful testimony of faith and a way that you use that verse, not only for yourself, but to spread the word with others. Charlie, what do you think of this topic? Well, David, this is a hard topic for me to comment on. In my active addiction or when drinking, I didn't read any books or have a positive quote to my vocabulary. I literally hadn't read a book since one called Shiloh in middle school. I certainly never opened up a Bible either, unfortunately. 
But once I found recovery, that changed. I found many, many books that help. One that helps big time is one called Living Sober. One thing that's hard for me is accepting life on life's terms. And this book really teaches me how to do so. It guides me through those life happenings and habits that I don't have control of and that I must. I must give away. With that said, and thinking of several other books like the Bible, the big book of AA, and a book called No Easy, Jesus leaves me thinking three phrases that I constantly go back to, which are, give it all away, go read your book, and do the next right thing. Man, whenever I'm rocked and I find myself unable to think more often than not, that I can muster up the simple phrase to me that a sponsor in AA said and ask myself, what's the next right thing here? After a few next right things, I find myself in a place where I can deal with life on life's terms, both mentally and physically. The other two phrases were given to me directly by the Lord when I heard his audible voice. In a broken moment in early recovery, he whispered to me so peacefully, give it all away. And when I prayed, because I thought I was insane in hearing voices, he whispered again, go read your book. I don't fully understand, give it all away. And, but I'm learning now through reading the book that the answers were in the Bible. And the Lord has let me know that I can give it all away, meaning those things stressing me out. They can be left at the foot of the cross. I was reading the book, No Easy Jesus, when this happened, and attending a meeting that reads Living Sober. And today I have lots of more books and I love them all. But I'd like to also share my favorite Bible verse that brings it all together. It's Matthew 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Thanks so much for that, Charlie. I think it's a challenge to all of us to figure out and fully understand what it means to give it all away. And how do we give away those things that keep stressing us out? How do we leave it, as you said, at the foot of the cross? Eddie, what do you think? For me, David, it's one of the chapters from your book, From Addict to Disciple. It mentions a young man who was at a rehab. It was his birthday and he asked to take a bus to go and spend time with his family. After he'd been insisting, he was finally allowed to go. He had an amazing time with his family, and on the Sunday, on his way to the bus stop, he decided to quickly go past and see his old mates at the shooting gallery. When he arrived, they were all so happy to see him and were so shocked to see how well he looked. Then the drug lord of the place wished him a happy birthday and told him he could have a hit on the house. There's no need to say he missed the bus that day. In reality, he missed the bus and for the rest of his life. I've told that story to almost everyone I know in addiction, and it reminded me of myself so many times in moments of craving. And every time, without a doubt, I always made sure that I was not going to make a permanent decision in a temporary situation by missing the bus. Don't miss the opportunity to make better decisions, to stay on track, not to wander away from the straight and narrow. Jesus gave me a ticket to gain redemption on the bus of grace. No way I will be missing that bus ever. Wow, good stuff, Eddie. I like the way you phrase that. Don't miss the bus ever. Dante, what do you think about today's topic? Well, for me, my quotes are both from the Bible. And for me, it starts with Psalm 27, verse 4, 5, and 6. And it says, One thing I have asked from the Lord that will I seek after for me to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to see the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion in the shelter of his tabernacle. He will hide me. He will set me on a rock. 
Now my head will be lifted up above my enemies in circling me, therefore. I will offer sacrifices of joy and his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. David, those verses often had a way of reeling me back in, that my ultimate goal in life was to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, knowing that my life does not protect me unless I'm dwelling in the house of the Lord and viewing it as my ultimate destination. And then, if at times discouraged, the end of Psalm 27 provides a challenge from God. Verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And I guess to wrap it up, from the book of James, it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, temptation to go back to addiction rears its ugly head on a consistent basis, especially earlier on in your time of sobriety or in times of distress and great challenge. This verse and promise reminds me that if I ignore the temptation, that I will receive a crown of life from the Lord in dignity and self-respect in this life and a literal crown in the next life because of my devotion to him. If I want life to start making sense, even in the moment, as some of these things seem to be contrary to my experience, I have to go vertical in my relationship and dealings in order to gain the proper perspective. And that North Star will ultimately lead me home. Good stuff, Dante. I think it's so important to realize that temptation is going to keep rearing its ugly head. And we need to have a way to lean on our higher power to go vertical and see that perspective. Harry, what do you think about this? David, for me, there's been a very special verse that I hold closely to my heart. My late pastor and our friend Rod Shires was an amazing teacher of the word and helped me understand scripture. The verse that was placed on my heart is from the book of Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. I have seen firsthand how God delivers on this promise. I prayed very specific prayers and they have come true. Some of my prayers are yet to be answered in this time, but I'm patient waiting on his timing. I highly promote this scripture to everyone I've experienced the blessings of the Lord, and he will do it for them as well as they approach him in obedience. Prayer is the only way to connect with God for me, to speak to him and confide in him. Prayer with faith and trust opens doors Prayer leads to healing and blessings. Ask and you will receive. Good word there, Harry. I like the challenge to all of us and all of our listeners. Ask and you will receive. Freddie, you ready to close this out today? Sure, David. And I want to give like a hodgepodge of verses to me because I have a whole bunch that I use. So guys, thank you for the opportunity. I think... Just generally, I lean on the third and seventh step prayers from AA and the serenity prayer. And also there's one on the post of the 521 Club where I go for regular meetings. And it says, thank you, God, for all you've given me, taken from me, and left me. See, an attitude of gratitude keeps me grounding. But I have lots of other quotes, too. One is from Brittany Burgunder. And she said, the best things come to those who never give up. You are not defined by your mental illness. Recovery is hard. Regret is harder. And another one that I hang on to comes from Buddha, which says thousands of candles can be lighted from a single candle and the life of the candle will not be shortened. Happiness never decreases by being shared. I think both of these remind me that recovery is a process. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes everything you've got. And we can't think about how long it will take to heal a recovery. We just need to keep putting one foot in front of the other. 
Recovery is not about figuring anything out. It's about having the will to take another step towards love. And I think it's important also to remember, as Sidney Harris said, happiness is a direction, not a place. And I like how Aristotle said, happiness is a quality of the soul, not a function of one's material circumstances. So we have to remember not to search for happiness in others because it'll make us feel alone. So we have to search for happiness in ourself. And in that way, we feel happy even when we find ourselves all alone. And I guess to close off, just two quotes, one from Bob Marley. It's better to die fighting for freedom than to be a prisoner all the days of your life. And by Deepak Chopra, every time you are tempted to react in the same old way, ask if you want to be a prisoner of the past or a pioneer of the future. And I think that's a good one for me because it keeps me between these two quotes, remembering the prisoner that I was in addiction and knowing that I want to be a pioneer of my future. Wow. Awesome stuff there, and just a a great way to end us off, Freddie. Guys, thanks for all your input, and I know that our listeners have found at least one or two quotes that they can use to keep them strong in recovery. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of the A to D from Addict to Disciple podcast. And I want to encourage all of you who listened to go back into your precious books, your precious quotes, reread them, re-listen to your favorite podcast episodes, and share them with a friend, share them with people in a group, however you can, to keep those quotes and those precious books precious in your recovery. If you'd like to reach out, you can message me on the link in this podcast or by email at david from a to d at gmail.com or go to my website www.fromatod.org and click on the contact page tune in monday for our next episode and as always stay safe and stay resilient